History for Detroit and for Michigan. The grand bargain is done. We'll break down the deal and the oversight. Plus the fight to build a new bridge to Canada and funding road fixes. It's analysis of news across Michigan. My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, and thanks so much for joining me for My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. So many times I've opened the show and said, another historic week for Detroit, and here we go again. What happened in Lansing with the grand bargain is a historic milestone for the bankruptcy process. We have never seen anything like this, and it involves everyone in the state. This is not a Detroit story. This is a Michigan story. Retirees live in every county, and the viability of our biggest city will impact all of us. So tonight, the grand bargain, what it took to make the deal, the oversight, foundation, and where we go from here. Plus the latest on the new international trade crossing and can Lansing get an agreement on fixing our roads? But we start with a grand bargain and let's take a look at the deal. Close to $195 million will go to Detroit to aid in the bankruptcy process. That includes offsetting cuts to pensions and protecting art at the DIA from being sold to satisfy creditors. This is added to $370 million from foundations and $100 million from the DIA. Conditions come with this money, though, a nine-member oversight commission that will have authority over Detroit's finances for the next 13 years. The governor is signing the bill this week. And this is where we start tonight with Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, we've been talking about can this deal actually get done, and it did. This is a victory for everyone, I would say. That's pretty remarkable. I didn't, uh, when you look at the votes, it was an overwhelming vote in support of this, uh, bipartisan vote. The governor and Kevin Orr and um, Jerry Rosen, the bankruptcy judge, uh, did a marvelous job of lobbying the, the legislature and making their case. So they weren't politicians this week. I think someone said that hmm. we were statesmen this week. Would you well, say that, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, well, okay, let's let's not get too excited. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 you're not even going to give the legislature a pass there's no, one week. Job. There's they no there's job. no Lincoln Excellent. or uh, Johnson uh, <laughs> in the in the process here, but but th there there was quite a bit of magnanimity, I think, and uh, uh, the leadership, I think, in on bo in both houses, in fact, uh, deserves a lot of credit. This wasn't an easy sell. Uh, and and Jace Bolger, who's the House Speaker, and Randy Richardville, the Senate Majority Leader, really uh, pushed hard to say this has got to be done and seemed to have uh, brought a lot of their colleagues to this new place where they're standing on the House floor, on the Senate floor, talking about, hey, look, I live in uh, Jackson or I live in uh, 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 West Branch, but I am you know, in, in, in colleague with Detroiters and, and that uh, what happens to them does matter to, to me and to my constituents. And I think that is very significant. I have not seen that before in that legislature. Well, it's never happened before. I was just going to say, what do you think took it to get to that point, though? You know, it's, it's a shift. There's been a real shift in attitudes uh, about Detroit, not just around here, but uh, statewide. I think there's a growing awareness, as Steve said, of the importance of Detroit to our overall state economy, but there's also a growing affection and enthusiasm for Detroit. People are rooting for the city, not just in Michigan, but all over the country. Yeah. And I think that's what you're seeing. That's a really interesting shift then. I, I think it is. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't remember seeing it before, not, not to the extent that we saw it over the last couple of weeks. You could feel it on Mackinac uh, last week, you know, mm -hmm. the number of outstate legislators who were genuinely, you know, excited about the idea of, uh, of being partners with, with Detroit. Uh, I, I, you just don't see it. You, you, you think of how, how well 
Mayor Duggan did, but uh, also how well Brenda Jones, the city council president, uh, seemed to play uh, up on Mackinac last week. I can't remember that happening. You know, and before. I think it's a really interesting point because so many times people say, what do you do up on Mackinac Island? And no matter how many times that we explain and here at Detroit Public Television, we're able to carry the conference live so people can see it uh, and see what's going on up there. I think there's where you see the value of what happens at Mackinac and even some of the side conversations that actually help get this deal done, Nolan. Yeah, there was a lot of that going on both on this and some other issues, the water um, authority, transportation. There was a, there were a lot of um, conversations going on about the big issues and, and of course none was bigger than this one. Once the House passed though, before we went up to Mackinac, I think the Senate was pretty much a foregone conclusion and what, yeah. what was worked on up there is easing over some of the concerns they had smoothing out the legislation. This went remarkably smoothly this week. What does this make us look like to the rest of the country, Stephen, this deal that we we're able to come up with? Well, it's unprecedented. I mean, uh, again, the, the bankruptcy itself is unprecedented because of the size uh, for a municipality, but this kind of deal inside a municipal bankruptcy is also completely unprecedented. I mean, you never see this kind of uh, private capital, philanthropic capital being being sort of showered on uh, a city and its uh, uh, creditors to try to ease that process. Now, the, the, the big question mark is we don't really know whether this is going to hold uh, through the, the legal process. I mean, is this is this okay? Uh, under a chapter nine. There are a lot of irregularities uh, in terms of the bankruptcy code um, uh, that, that are sort of baked into this deal. And you know the judge is gonna have to defend those if he decides to approve the deal. And then it's gonna have to, it's gonna have to stand up at the appellate level, which- uh, Well, before that things. though, it's gotta pass. The retirees have to accept it. The retirees the have to accept and it that's too, a, sure. you know, That vote, those ballots are due in July 11. Yeah. If, they, if they turn it down, if they vote no out of out of anger, frustration, yeah. or somehow the belief that there's a better deal coming, this thing goes away. It scuttles, and I don't yeah. know where we are then. Well, and yeah. you still have the sort of irresponsible union leaders of ASME, police and fire, other unions, not stepping up and saying, "Look, guys, you should take this because this yeah. is as good." Although you as do you have you do have some you do have some union leaders saying some. the opposite uh, and saying, "Look, this is the best." that we can do and you got to vote for it. You also have the ballots now coming in. Uh, Kevin Orr says that the ones that have come in so far are two to one, two to one. in favor. That's important. Um, uh, you know, I think you don't need, a, you don't need everybody to approve it, obviously. No. Mm -hmm. uh, you need 51% of the, of the dollar amount. Actually, it's a strange, uh, it's a strange calculation. It's not 51% of the retirees. Um, yeah, and Kevin Orr said uh, just last week, he said he's not taking anything for granted. I think he even still said it this week. He said, look, I mean, this is still part of the process that, you know, in July when they go into court, you yeah. know, that we do celebrate what happened this week and what this agreement was, but no, no way are we done no, by a long shot. Creditors got to buy in and uh, pensioners have to buy in. And if that doesn't happen, this thing could stretch on and on and on. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you get Judge Rhodes in a position where he's got to cram this down, mm -hmm. On enough creditors, um, you know, you you increase the likelihood uh, of of some sort of appeal that undoes it. And so I think, you know, the bargaining that that has been taking place in terms of, you know, trying to get people to settle, uh, big creditors to settle, will continue um, between now and and when they have this trial uh, in July to to sort of. Uh, finalize this whole thing. You, you want to get as many people as you can to say, I'm okay with this deal, uh, and I think this is the best I can do. I, I see something like this and I say, how long can the good feelings last <laughs> of all of us, of, of, of really everyone working together on this front, Nolan? Well, I mean, hopefully we're seeing a new dynamic at work. Again, you had, well, this was one of the rare things we've seen come out of Lansing with really true bipartisan support. Both the Democratic and the Republican leadership were on board and most of their caucuses. And who knows, roads coming up, uh, that's a tough issue. Uh, maybe uh, maybe it'll, it'll, 
extend to that and some other things. All right, so the, another large question looming about this is we see this happening for Detroit. And the next question, and I asked the governor this last week, so there are so many other cities who are watching this and saying, um, we're in financial trouble. Could this possibly be a pathway for us that we could get some kind of help from the state? And he said, well, this is a very unique circumstance. <laughs> so, Stephen, from your angle, I mean, does this line up other cities and municipalities saying, okay, can we get some money to help us out financially down the road? Well, not in a bankruptcy. I mean, I think if you see anyone else going to bankruptcy, it would look really different mm -hmm. from what we're seeing in Detroit. There's no grand bargain for Flint, right? Uh, you're not going to see the philanthropic support come through, and uh, uh, their assets won't be protected the way that, that people try to protect things in Detroit. I think separate from that, though, is the question of whether uh, we can finally start this conversation about how we finance municipal government and local services in this in this state, which is really broken. Uh, and there are a lot of very, very tricky um, uh, questions that need to be sorted through there. Like, how do we want to do it? How much taxes do people here want to pay? Uh, how much government do we want to have uh, at the local level? Those are all things, those are all very fundamental questions that we seem to sort of be dancing around with things like the emergency manager law. Uh, but, but at some point, we're going to have to sit down and say, we have more government than we are willing to pay for right now, and that is unsustainable. Uh, so we got to figure out you know, either to pay more or to have less. All right, so there may not be a grand bargain that would ever happen to Flint, but would there ever be, a, a, again, any money from the state? Well, we asked the governor that, and he said he expects others to ask, but the answer <laughs> is no. Um, he's said they're going to try to do a little better job of early warning, uh, with the early warning to intervene in communities that are getting in trouble, not let it go so far that uh, bankruptcy becomes the only option as it was in Detroit. Remember, if, you, if the state would have stepped in two, three years ago uh, with emergency manager, with some other help, straightening out the fans, uh, finances, bankruptcy might not have been necessary. It was really the last two, three, four years that that debt started escalating yeah, beyond think, control. Do you really think that bankruptcy wouldn't have been necessary? I think had they got ahead of this borrowing, if the state had stepped in and stopped this borrowing for operations, which they did very heavily which for they've three been, or four been years, for a while, yeah. and you know that just pushed them over to the point where they couldn't meet yeah. their obligations. Did he really have a choice, though? Sure. At that opportunity. Well, the choice restructure. The choice at that point was uh, to to borrow or to file bankruptcy. Quite frankly, I mean, again, these are fundamental problems. This is uh, it's not just it's not just mismanagement or waste. Uh, those are very. Uh, glib and simple uh, uh, answers to what's going on and it's part of the problem but it's not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that you've lost something like 35 percent of the, the the taxable value of uh, the city of Detroit and you can't you, you just can't generate the money you need to deliver services. You've got to... But Steve they had several chances over the years to get in front of this pension problem and didn't do it. They, they didn't had have the money. Several, well, they had several chances to restructure operations to yeah. get a more rational opera, and they they just but allowed. Yeah, but when, your back's, when your back's not up against the yeah. wall, when and you're finally facing this, is it's it's almost easier to make a deal when you find like the now we're finally on the operation the side. That's why they waited until. But the, the price problems point. the problems on the operation side are not what drove us into bankruptcy. It was the massive unfunded liabilities that were driven by declining tax base. But we, we kept adding to that both in, in the, on the operating side and the pension side. Yeah, and had did. the state stepped in two or three years earlier, they might have been able to fix this. I think, short of I think the swaps deal, uh, which was, was the killer, which was uh, about fixing what, 2005 pension. 2005 about? Uh, uh, 2005 originally, and then re uh, renegotiated in 2009 to securitize uh, the casino revenue to pay for it. Uh, those two deals, which were all about pensions, right? Uh, that was to fill a $400 million uh, for shortfall in pensions. Once we did that, I think we, that were, sealed the we deal. were done. Okay, so now we have, we're going to have state oversight in the city of Detroit for the next 13 years. Is that enough to stabilize, to make sure that there are no other deals like that that are made to ensure Detroit's financial viability? I mean, that depends on a lot of things. Certainly for the short term, Detroit's going to have a much better balance sheet and going to have money for to do a lot of things they haven't been able to do so well the last several years. Uh, services, public safety, what have you. But it doesn't necessarily change the fact that the, the tax base is still shrinking. They have to very quickly stabilize this population and start growing the city again. This plan depends on uh, city 
revenue growing, the city's economic base growing. That doesn't happen. There's no way long term they can sustain a healthy balance sheet. Is this oversight the best possible option? It's, I mean, it's necessary. You have to have some mechanism to say, to say no when, when politicians won't. Um, I mean, we've seen that over and over in Detroit, that, uh, you know, leadership is unable to make the tough decisions to, to keep us out of financial trouble. Yeah. We've got good leadership right now, uh, both at the, at the mayor, uh, in the mayor's office and at the council table, but four years from now, eight years from now, who knows what that looks like. You could get somebody else uh, who's, who's irresponsible. So you need that oversight. You also are going to need uh, growth, as Nolan no was talking about. If you can't grow the city's tax base, you're not going to get out of this. And you need more investment. The state uh, has really, really changed the way it funds local uh, municipalities. You look at the, the, the revenue sharing model that we came up with 30 years ago mm -hmm. to sustain uh, local government is broken. It doesn't work anymore. So we got to think of some other way to get all that stuff done. Yeah, before we leave this topic, I want to talk really quickly about um, the contribution from the foundations um, that is coming in with a grand bargain. And you even saw that the Skillman Foundation stepped up with, with, with $4 million. Do we see somewhere down the road um, any kind of void of money in other programs because there are so much foundation money going towards this grand bargain. Will we see that hurt in other places? Well, the foundations um, all say no. Well, you know this, <laughs> but it's bound. To. That's a lot of money. Uh, the pie isn't unlimited. Uh, the, you know the, the resources these foundations have are finite. So yes, unless some others step up, unless they grow the overall donor base in this community, I talked to several of the. Uh, the arts uh, organizations over the past few days for my column today, and they're all worried about the impact of this. They all support the grand bargain, but they all also are in there reworking their own strategies to see how they can increase their donor base because the same folks who are funding the grand bargain for the, the DIA, you know, they're the ones who fund everything else, and so there's less money to go around. But it's not just there. The Wayne County Commission this morning voted on... Um, on uh, money for the M1 rail, taking $3 million out of the road funds for the M1 rail. That's money that would have gone perhaps to smooth roads in western Wayne County. So there's, there's, there is this sense, growing sense out there <laughs> that Detroit's sucking away a, a, a maybe a disproportionate amount of resources. What do you there. think the impact will be, Stephen? I mean, I, I don't think we know. I mean, these are foundations, that I would say, that are super committed to the city, and that's a good thing, right? These are not uh, people just sort of swooping in and saying, well, I'll help out now, but they have got uh, long-term investments uh, in stuff that's going on. I think one of the things that's really interesting to me here is the involvement of the Ford Foundation uh, in New York, uh, who sort of took the lead in trying to get some of the other foundations to, to, to commit to this. Ford's not all that involved in Detroit. I mean, historically, they've, they've, there's been a distance there. And I think in that particular instance, this could be, you know, opening the door to a much more robust uh, involvement with the city. In that case, we might come out ahead. Uh, and that's the key. If we could, because Ford hasn't, the Ford Foundation hasn't been here. It's, yeah. That's separate from the, the It's not the Ford foundation, Family Foundation, uh, right. Uh, but they haven't been that involved here in many, many years. The family is no longer controls right. it. But uh, if you can get foundations who haven't been involved here, and I think that's, you know, playing off this symphony, symp sympathy and, and growing enthusiasm for Detroit. Uh, nationwide, that if you can get different players yeah. in here, you can ease out the impact of this $460 million. And maybe get some more funding down the road. All right. All right, a quick look at other stories making news. A big step for the new bridge to Canada. And will lawmakers decide on road funding before they take off for summer break? All right, let's first talk about the new international trade crossing mm -hmm. and uh, kind of a little bit of, of news that the Coast Guard gave a permit um, for uh, for the new bridge <laughs> down the road from Maddie Maroon's bridge. So does that end the Maroon fight, not, Nolan? Not even yeah. close. I mean, <laughs> and right now it's not necessarily Maroon that's holding it up. They still don't have federal funding for those customs plaza. And you can't do anything until the feds move on that $250 million needed to build customs plazas. I don't know what the Obama administration is waiting for. I don't know why our congressional delegation isn't in there pounding on the door every day saying, look, in terms of, by Washington's standards, there's a whole lot of money 
and this bridge now can't go anywhere until the feds approve that money. All right, so where are we, Stephen? Well, actually, everything is moving ahead. I mean, this Coast Guard permit is an example. There's lots of... That still uh, was a, a pretty big step, wasn't it's it? It's a huge step. I mean, there are lots of um, sort of background and sort of foundational kinds of things that need to be done way before you get to the idea of building the Customs Plaza. If, if we got the money for the Customs Plaza at this point, it would be it would be huge, obviously, but it would really just sort of uh, justify all the other things that are already going on. I mean, you, you don't want to be doing it and worried that you won't get that money. And I don't, actually don't have much worry that we won't get. I think uh, you know there are lots of other infrastructure. But they're not going to start any construction without it. They they shouldn't start construction without. Yeah. It, but we're not at the construction point yet. I mean, I guess my point is there are lots of things that need to be done before you put shovels in the ground. For this bridge and those things are happening and so we are moving in the right direction uh, I would expect that probably in the next budget uh, next year uh, we'd have much more likely uh, chance of getting that 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 customs plaza money it, you know there's other infrastructure projects around the country that that need that money it now more immediate a more yeah. immediate funding yeah. all right well let's go ahead and speaking of funding and speaking about all the love and goodwill that's going on in Lansing right now so <laughs> what can we expect for for a road fix and do you think Nolan <laughs> they're going to be able to uh, decide on possibly a gas tax before in the next couple of weeks before uh, summer break I think they'll come up with something I think it'll be well short of what's needed the billion and a half a year that's needed I don't think it'll be the quarter a gallon uh, uh, gas hike. Why not? And it, well, it's an election year and you're, they're asking for it, they're considering it at a time when gasoline now is pushing back in the summer toward its, you know, all-time anyway. yeah. highs. I mean, once you get gas start, starts hitting that $4 a gallon mark, people say, <laughs> I know, Whoa. but do we have short-term memory? Do we not remember? Well, I mean, are we still we not go. driving the same listen, roads people, that are awful? People agree the roads are a mess, they want them fixed, but they still don't believe that extra monies. We did that poll. We've talked about it on the show. They still don't accept the idea that extra money is needed. No, I would argue that people might, they accept that extra money is needed, but I'm not quite sure that there's political will there for politicians to put their neck on the Listen, line to say, there is not I'm, we're going to tax you on it. There is not public will. People yeah. believe they're already paying. And I mean, they look at our gas prices, other right. states' gas prices and say, they're the same. Um, and so they don't believe the money they're giving is being spent well. They're convinced it's not being used efficiently. And in other, and the truth is, other states do take more money from the general fund and put it toward roads than they Michigan do. does. We're the 10th lowest in terms of general fund support That's right. of roads. Yeah. So do you think that that may be simmer for the summer and come back in the fall and, I, and take a look at a, a hybrid sort easier of Easier after the election. I hope Steven? so. You know, the governor said something yesterday that when he was with us. He said, you know, if you think this pothole season was bad, you wait to see what next one looks like. If oh, we I don't, don't want to. If we, if we don't start doing this. I mean, people's... Uh, this is this is infuriating. I think if you're if you're any sort of fiscal conservative, right? You're, people don't want to pay a couple hundred dollars more, maybe in gas or registration fees, but will pay twelve hundred dollars to get the 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 axles and the tie rods and everything else replaced on their car when they hit one of these potholes. It is absolutely foolish thinking. Um, but it's an election year, and the whole idea of raising revenues. Uh, in, in election years, it makes people do silly things. Particularly that visibly. You slap 25 cents a gallon on a tax on, and people see it on those signs every time they pass the gas station. So if they don't make a decision in the next couple of weeks, you miss part of a construction season, is oh. there a possibility then do you think something will happen in the fall? You know, they'll do something. Uh, they'll Probably come up the with some, yeah. some money. In terms of a comprehensive transportation solution, be easier in the lame duck than it is in June. Yeah, All right. they're not going to do it before the election. All right, we'll have to watch and see what happens. Gentlemen, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. And that is going to do it for My Week. Thanks so much for joining us. We are at myweek.org and on Facebook and Twitter. Come back and see us next Thursday for My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night. See you next week.